I wanted to talk with you today, if I could, from uh, the story of Luke in chapter 19. It's a story that we've all heard before, and many times we uh, even decorate the church this way with palm branches. It's called Palm Sunday. It's it's the Sunday morning, the week before Jesus was crucified. And uh, I'd like to share with you, if I could, today, uh, this story. And uh, hopefully you will um, <clears throat> find it as interesting as I do. You see, uh, that morning, Jesus had reminded his disciples to... Uh, that he was going to Jerusalem. And um, he basically had told them already that he was going to die. But uh, he sends two of his disciples ahead to a nearby village to carry out some special errands. And this is how um, uh, Luke had put it. He said he approached Bethany and Bethpage at the at the hill called the Mount of Olives, and he sent two of his disciples, saying, "Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you're going to find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them, the Lord needs it." The disciples must have wondered what. Jesus, what he had told him to do, because none of the gospel accounts uh, about the ministry of Jesus ever mentioned Jesus ever riding an animal to get from one place to another. He he had walked hundreds of miles up and down hills, and 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 now he calls, um, uh, and now he's he's asking for them to um, to go fetch him a, 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 a colt. And he gives this unusual command to go in that village and get that cold and, you know, and to bring it to him. And it must have seemed strange for him to do something like that. He, he even tells them the exact words to use if anyone was to question them. The Lord needs it. it was it prearranged? Did, did others know that, uh, what Jesus was going to do? We really don't know. It was obvious, though, that Jesus knew what he was going to face in the city of Jerusalem. So he... He makes this decision to go to Jerusalem, and it must have been one of the most difficult decisions that he ever made. And on top of that, to ride into the city on a colt rather than walk in, as he's often done before, must have been even more difficult decision because riding a colt into the city was a public declaration that he was a king. You see, many times in times of war, the conqueror would ride on a prancing stallion, but in times of peace, the king would ride on a colt to symbolize that peace prevailed. So for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem upon that colt was to declare that he was a king. You often wonder how people would respond to that. How would they recognize and, and would they recognize uh, his kingdom, you know, and and because really, Jesus later tells uh, the uh, Pilate that, uh, you know, his kingdom is not of this world. It was a spiritual kingdom. He was to be a spiritual king. Chances uh, are, because he had been teaching them that for, for three and a half years, and still they hadn't learned that lesson. So... Maybe some would greet him with laughter. Maybe they would be amused at what he was doing. And after all, he was it was rather a ridiculous picture. He was a carpenter declaring himself to be a king. Perhaps some would think that he was really sort of crazy, living in a world of fantasy, imagining himself to be this king. And they'd laugh at him. Others would greet him with anger, upset because they would interpret his writing into the city as arrogance and blasphemy against God. And of course, they would hail, some would hail him as, uh, with joy, welcome, welcoming him as an earthly king come to reestablish the throne of David, overthrow the, the Roman Empire. They were ready and they were eager to place a crown upon his head. Among those crowds would be people that he healed. Some among the thousands he fed. 
Many more had seen some of the miracles and listened to, to the, the words of, that he spoke with authority. And, and uh, all of them, their lives had been changed. Jesus knew all of this. He knew exactly just over the horizon was the cross looming like, like a monster, ready to consume him. But Luke tells us that in spite of all of this, he still set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus rides toward the gates of the city, and as he rides toward the gates of the city, the crowds begin to grow. There is a festive air of it all before it was the Passover and pilgrims were gathering from far and near for this greatest of all Jewish holidays. He would be like for us our Christmas or our Easter. And even before Jesus arrives, the news had spread that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. You can imagine the excitement that must have prevailed there. You could hear people think, talking and saying, had you heard the news? Lazarus was dead and he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, Jesus comes along and, is, and, 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 and now he's walking around. They took all of his grave clothings off and he actually is walking and breathing and living again. Surely only a Messiah, the Son of God, could do something like that. And so they began to cut down these palm branches and they were shouting, Hosanna to the king. Excitement prevailed throughout the whole city. And Jesus looked over his waiting audience and he must have seen the mixture of emotional uh, of expressions of their faces. There were those who, who loved him. Perhaps blind Bartimaeus, a man who received his sight and no longer in beggar's rags. How about Zacchaeus? He paid back his debt to society and he, he made his peace with God. And the lepers, the, their skin had been cleansed and now they were rejoicing for the healing that God had given them. Maybe J. Iris, his daughter perhaps was there, back to life after experiencing death and of course, Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Mary Magdalene. They were all there. Their lives reflect the love that was, that was in their hearts for this man who, who taught them and molded them and changed them. There were also sinister faces, their faces with squinty eyes and, and uh, uh, waiting for him to say one wrong word or to make one mistake, and there they would pounce on him. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were there. They were supposed to be the keepers of the law, the spiritual leaders. But Jesus had gained so much popularity that, that, they, that they feared him. So full of jealousy, they watched him. And, and, of course, the Romans, they were there, fearing revolt and watching for any sign of rebellion against Rome. They were ready and waiting to crush any uprising that would up happen and Jesus realized as he listened to the hosannas that soon the sinister voices would drown out the voices of love. That those crying for him would be, would be king would soon be crying, crucify him, crucify him. Or staying, standing there and saying nothing at all. And isn't that the way some of us have, as Christians are today? We see wrong going on in the world, and yet we don't say nothing. We just keep quiet and stand still and watch what's happening. Oh, church, we need to make some changes in our lives. We need to make some things that that right now are are uh, that have changed. And 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 I want you to know that this this virus that that is going on right now. It can make changes for good, or it can make changes for bad. It's all up to you. It's all up to you. What are those changes going to be for you? Hey, can I suggest, 
if you haven't done it already? How about starting a, a family altar? You're all in it together. You're all there, and yeah, you can turn the TV on and watch a bunch of nothing. But what about picking up God's Word and and reading it and sharing your interpretation, dads, with your your spouse and your children and encouraging them oh to do the right things to do the things that God would want them to do rather than what they see being done on television well all of this crowds and all of these things were going on and in uh, Jerusalem, and and uh, they were all they're, they're, all of these things were going on. Even the apostles, they they were reacting all all to this. I would have thought that Judas was probably ecstatic, ba- basking in the reflected glory, because Judas may have wanted an earthly kingdom more than anybody else. And I imagine that Peter walked with his chest expanded, enjoying the throngs and the cheers of the crowd, maybe with one hand on his sword just in case something went wrong, thinking to himself, maybe it was worth it to leave the fishnets in the boats. Maybe at last we're going to get what we deserve. Well, there was also possibly Thomas a bit skeptical about everything that was going on and wondering what was going to happen next. In fact, it was Thomas that said, well, why don't we go to Jerusalem and die with him? Maybe Andrew was overwhelmed by it all. He was so used to bringing people to Jesus one by one or in small groups. And now look at all of them, all of these people that were there. And then you have the two brothers of thunder, James and John. Do you suppose that that they were thinking about Jesus being crowned king? And so who would be on his right and who would be on his left in positions of authority and power? They were all there in Jerusalem, loving faces, sinister faces, anxious apostles, crowds trampling over uh, one another. And then suddenly the whole possession stops. Everything grinds to a halt. You probably have had that happen once or twice if you've ever traveled the interstates. And all of a sudden there's a wreck up ahead and everything has stopped. And you creep along very slowly. And by the time you get there to where the accident was, you wonder what in the world was everybody slowing down so far so fast for and and what was going on because there's hardly anything there well they cleaned it all up and they moved on but all of a sudden this procession stops and everybody's wondering what's the hold up what's going on why why don't these guys move on and and then the the people that were closest to Jesus well they could realize and they seen that it was he who stopped the parade When they saw his body begin to shake, maybe their first thought, he was laughing. Laughter would have seemed to be natural, for everybody else was laughing and joy was being prevailed there. But when they saw his face, they, they saw no evidence of laughter. Rather, they saw sorrow and tears, and he wasn't laughing, he was crying. The scriptures tell us that Jesus acted emotionally many times from different scenes that he saw. When he saw the poor, when he saw the hungry, when he saw the people sinning, when he saw the ill, the scriptures repeatedly said that he had compassion on them. But it only tells us of two times that he cried. One time he cried at the grave of Lazarus. You remember Mary and Martha were both weeping and It says that Jesus wept with them. He wept for them. He entered into their grief and compassion, and he identified with their sorrow and despair. The second occasion, he looked at the city of Jerusalem, and he saw the mixtures of faces, the masses of humanity crowding there, and he realized the emptiness in their lives. They had not heard the message of peace. They did not understand the purpose of his coming. 
Listen to what it says in Luke chapter 19. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and your children within the walls. And they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, they had eyes, but they didn't see. They had ears, but they didn't hear. They missed the whole point of the message that God had given them. And the fact that they waved palm branches showed that they didn't understand because that is exactly what they did when the Maccabees overthrew the Syrian oppressors and reestablished the, the worship in the temple. By waving palm branches, they were showing what they expected Jesus to be, another warlord, another general of armies, one who would lead them to overthrow the Romans. But Jesus said, I didn't come for that purpose. I came to show you more an excellent way. I came to show you the way of love. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if someone smites you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone give, wants your coat, give him your shirt as well. If they, com if they command you to carry their pack a mile, go too. And those people who listened to him must have thought, well, those are beautiful words, but surely he doesn't mean Rome. He doesn't expect us to love Rome. Only a lunatic would, would command you to love Rome. We can't love Rome. But don't you see that's exactly what he was saying? Love even Rome. Because Rome with her mighty army had seen the power of the sword, but Rome had never seen the power of love. Show them love. Show them love. Church, if I could encourage you in any way, over this time period, over this, this, this period of, of, of worries and concerns. Oh, show, show this world love. Show them the love that, that God has put in your heart and into your life. Show them how much you love them, how much you appreciate all that they do. The nation of Israel had the great opportunity to show Roman, Rome something new but and different, but they just didn't understand Jesus because they just completely misunderstood his mission. And he wept over them because the opportunity was going to be taken away and they would never, ever, ever have it again. These were God's people, God's chosen people. God had loved them. He, he led them across the wilderness into the promised land. And, but they didn't understand the Messiah when he walked in their midst. Because of that, he wept. What a contrast. He sits upon a beast of burden. He sees the towering temple of God silhouetting against the sky. But beyond that, in the years immediately ahead, he sees the army of Titus surrounding the holy city. He sees the temple stones being torn down and the whole city leveled. He sees the bodies in the streets and the blood running in the gutters and hundreds of thousands of people crying because they were starving to death while Titus, or Titus waits for Jerusalem to surrender. And all of this because they didn't recognize the Messiah. When he came, how different their lives would have been. How different the history of Israel would have been if they'd only recognized the one who came in the midst riding on a colt. It's Matthew who adds that Jesus looked at the city and he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wings? But you would not come today. It's just a city. And it's just like the city of Jerusalem. We find ourselves in the presence of Jesus. And I wonder what he finds when he looks into our faces. 
Does he see people concerned about so many things, worried about the income tax, worried about job security, worried about their health or lack of it, worried about this virus? Does he see people who are so busy doing other things here and there, so busy that they never bother those things that are eternally important? Oh, but he should see those things. Does he see people who recognize him for who he is? The Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. When he turns and looks into our lives, I wonder, will he weep once again because of what he sees? Or will he have the joy that passes all understanding as we respond to his outstretched arms and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Well, church today, I just wonder, what does he see in your life? What does he see in mine? And doesn't it make you stop and think, oh, shouldn't I do more? Shouldn't I be more about his business? Shouldn't I be helping the, the Word of God into hearts and lives. You know, the other day I had a repairman out here at my house. My refrigerator isn't working right, and he came out, and he was talking. He was telling me what had happened with the refrigerator and, and that it was gonna ha I was going to have to replace it. Yeah, it's right there. You can see it back there. That big old thing there, I'm going to have to replace it. It isn't cheap. And I said, okay. And, and he said, but you know, you have this in, this in plan, this insurance. And he says, that'll help you replace that refrigerator. And I said, yeah, that's great. And we were talking for just a few moments, and he stopped and he paused, and he said, can I just say something? He didn't know what I did for a living or anything like that. He said, I just want you to know, there's something unique about you. And I just smiled at him, and he said, no, really. He says, I don't see what I'm seeing in you from a lot of people anymore. And it was my springboard into opening up and talking with him about the Lord. And I said to him that, I said, well, I'm, I love the Lord and I follow Jesus. And I said, even with all the stuff going on in the world, I'm concerned about the world, but listen, I'm okay, whatever Jesus wants to do. And he says, that's exactly what I'm, I'm thinking about you. He says, he says, I don't see that in, in people. And I said, well, what about you? And he says, oh, he says, I worry sometimes, and I'm not always where I should be. And I said, but you can be. And uh, I said, all you have to do is, is to ask Jesus in your heart and your life. And he said, yeah, he says, Maybe I should. And he says, but he says, I'll tell you what. When I have to come back to work on the refrigerator, he says, maybe we can take time to do that. He says, I'm on a schedule right now. And my heart just sank for this young man. Because he missed the opportunity. And I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss the opportunity of walking close to Jesus and staying close to him. Because he's the only one that will help you in all of your times of trouble and need. He'll be there. It tells us that, yea, I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. 
He's with you today, church. He's with you today, you who are listening to this broadcast. I would hope and pray that you would ask him into your heart. It's not very hard at all. In fact, it's, it's more simple than the world makes it out to be. You see, all you have to do is to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart and my life and to cleanse me of all of my sins. I recognize and accept you as the Son of the living God. And I want to follow after you all the rest of my days of my life. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. And if you said that prayer in your heart, if you meant it in your heart, God has heard it. And oh, your name now is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And all of heaven is rejoicing because of what you've done today. God bless you. And uh, we look forward to being with you uh, midweek and, and also next Sunday is Easter. And uh, it's going to be an unusual Easter, but we're, we're believing God for great and mighty things. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for tuning in to this broadcast. Take care now. Bye-bye.